So hopefully we'll have other opportunities to see your film. Uh, <laughs> I think this is the second time it's been shown in public. So it's hard to get films like this shown anymore. I remember uh, back in the 1980s and 90s, uh, John Joe's films used to play fairly regularly in San Francisco, the Art Institute, the Roxy Theater, and that was always the uh, high point of the month uh, when my friends and I saw that on the schedule. Uh, I remember about 30 years seeing your plain talk and common sense, I think, and I asked you uh, why at the end of that movie, it's a black and white final uh, sequence, there's a red line on the side of the frame, and you yes. said it's to uh, keep it interesting for you, to hold your attention. Yeah. And I'm struck that every single frame of his films, and this is not the only film that this is the case, is quite beautiful, fascinating in its own right, you know, painterly. Um, so you, you have a real visual flair and an interesting, um, I think, relationship with landscapes. Uh, how did you decide on uh, this film in this particular place? Um, well, I knew the area because I lived there for a while in uh, Port Hadlock, <clears throat> otherwise known as Port, locally known as Port hard luck for cover up because of the kind of people who live there like me. Um, uh, and Steve lived there and I visited Steve quite often and stayed at his house a number of times. Um, and way in the back of it uh, was a, uh, uh, there's a distributor named Marcus Hu, who usually originally came from San Francisco, I believe, uh, had a thing called Strand Releasing, which is essentially mostly gay films, and not just, but mostly gay films, or unmarketable Euro art films. And um, he was always pressing me to make a gay film, and so I thought, well, okay, we'll make a, make a gay film. I didn't make it for him, but it was sort of, okay, we'll make a gay, make a gay film. And uh, somehow in the back of my head, I, I, I didn't have a story. I just had, okay, a gay couple breaking up. That's the, the, all I had going for it. Everything they said was improvised, um, essentially around... Uh, uh, there was a backstory because John Mano used to work, be the director of the community theater in, in uh, Port uh, Angeles. And um, he had done a casting call, and Steve had gone to the casting call for some play he wanted to be in. Steve also was director for this thing. Yeah. And uh, apparently, typical theater stuff, they did a casting call, but the guy already knew who he wanted, and it wasn't Steve. So then Steve got <laughs> pissed off. <laughs> And I think that, you know, tension, you know, there, there was clearly, between them, there was clearly a tension. So it played good for, a, you know, a bickering, bitchy, you know, gay couple. <laughs> uh, and uh, basically, um, Steve inverted the roles of his own partner, right? He, he played his partner in, in, the, in, in what the kinds of things they brought up and talked about. It was all straight out of his life, except being on the other side of the fence. Um, what may, I, I don't know what makes me do films. <laughs> it certainly isn't to make any money, and certainly with films like this, it's because uh, um, I don't know what else. I, I'm finally learning what else to do. Maybe nothing. I, I'm about ready to say. There's certainly not the first of your films that deals with relationships or tensions in relationships. I, I think there's quite a few films like that. Uh, yeah, I would say <laughs> very many of them deal with uh, uh, tensions in couples or tensions in, you know, mar you know, whatever. One of my earlier third film was a third feature film. Keep in mind, I made, did make shorts for 10 years before I made any features. Um, uh, Last Chance for a Slow Dance, which is one of the ones that's better known. And I do make a little money off of it because it was published in a book called... Uh, Re referenced in a book called A Thousand and One Films You Must See Before You Die. And so, about, you know, two or three times, three times a month, sometimes once a month, I'll get this, you're the last one. <laughs> I finally found you. I want a copy. And so I say, okay, now you can die. <laughs> uh, but that was about, you know, it wasn't so much about a couple, it was just about an asshole guy. You know, of which there's plenty in the world. <laughs> and that that uh, the title of that film, Last Chance, is C H A N T S. It's a sort of a pun, I suppose. 
Uh, well, it was named that because uh, because it had like six or seven of my songs in it, and the songs were an integral part of the narrative. So it was, you know, it rhy it's a nice rhyme. Last chance for a slow dance has double meaning, seeming orally anyway, and it was the last songs for a slow dance. One of the but, remarkable things is you just witness is the role of music in uh, John Joe's films. Uh, the, the film I saw just before this, they had it coming. Yeah. I believe you're singing in that yeah, also. Yeah, that's my stuff. Which is quite, it was quite moving in the film. And then when the credits came up, I thought, oh, that's amazing. That's the director himself singing. I said, who is that singer? Um, just the whole oral dimension of the film is also very, uh, I was quite struck in this film, for weeks after seeing it, I heard uh, the WC playing mm -hmm. in my head, and uh, likewise, you know, it's, it's interesting. That, that was all just happenstance. It happened. John played harp, and I'm not going to let that go. It happened. <laughs> it happened that Steve flew an airplane. And I'm not going to let that go. So it's just sort of, you know, I had no story when it began. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, you play harp. Well, let's see if we can weave that in. Uh, 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 I have a filmmaker friend, Mark Rappaport, uh, who loved uh, coming to terms, uh, uh, the film, two films before this one. And then I sent him this one, Mark is Gay, and he, he, he said he absolutely loathed this film. <laughs> this film. <laughs> because, because he said, who would want to spend two months or two minutes around these bitchy guys? <laughs> to which I concur, yeah, this is true. And then he, and then he told me, and I hate harp music, and I, <laughs> and I hate wind chimes. So I said, well, I guess I hit the trifecta. <laughs> yeah, <sorry. laughs> I actually love the wind chimes because it, to me, it kind of transitioned from the sounds and the sights of water, mm -hmm. you know, the sounds of nature, and then the wind chimes are sort of, if you might say, are played by nature because mm -hmm. it's the yeah. wind that's playing it, and then you go to the harp. And there seems this whole tension between uh, how we are living our lives against a backdrop of nature yep. and nature's doing some of it. We're pushed and pulled by these forces and then we ourselves are you know, creating this fragile existence uh, there. I thought you know, the, the different images that you had really nicely uh, summarized that. And, and you know. Shall we ask for some questions? Yes, questions from the audience. Ellie, uh, here's the mic. Hi. I don't think I need this. I, I can. Okay. Yeah. Okay. She can project. We're recording. I'm recording. Oh, so you have to use this. Oh, I'll do my best. I'm sure the first film I saw by you was Rembrandt Laughing. Could you say a little bit about? Um, what that film meant to you or the experience of making the film, anything at all about it. I, I love that film. Uh, well, it was made like most of my films uh, uh, with my friends. Uh, in this case, it was normally I make films in two or three weeks. In Rembrandt Laughing, I wanted to take a long time, and I told everybody who was involved. They were Most of them were friends of mine. A few of them were friends of the friends of mine who got brought into the film. And... Um, and I just told him, well, I want to do, take our time. And, you know, when you have an afternoon off and can give me an afternoon, then we'll shoot. And so that film, I don't really remember how long it took, maybe six months, I don't really remember. Uh, but it was very casually done. I think it was done in order. And uh, there was no script. Uh, I had a, a central idea for it, which was I wanted to tell a story by leaving out by leaving gaps in it. So the film starts on a Sunday morning, it goes to the next uh, mon Monday later in the morning, and it's going through characters as it's doing this, and basically you're going, the, each scene is, is a progression in time through a day until I think you get to Thursday, and then it jumps a week. So we don't know what happened in that week, in between week, and then it jumps a month, and we don't know what happened in that, and then it jumps a year, and one of our lead characters has died, and things like that. <laughs> but we're not giving any, you know, we're not told how, why, what. It's just you find out, okay, one of the people's dead. And um, in fact, the. Uh, uh, the person who's dead, I just spent the afternoon with him looking at his gorgeous films, Nathaniel Dorsky. Um, uh, uh, 
So it it, it was a, it was a concept about uh, using time as a structure, uh, but the story was you know just improvised and made up along the way with things like you know. The, it was shot in, where are you, Barbara? There's Barbara. It was shot in Barbara's apartment. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it was shot, you know, it was just shot in places, so just my friend's places or where they worked. Uh, and and it's just put together like that. I don't th my the way I imagine myself making films usually is that uh, I'm going along the street and I have a vague idea and I find a piece here and a piece there and and it's like a it's like a jigsaw puzzle and as I say until I get enough pieces and say okay now let's put the jigsaw puzzle together and see what see what comes out of it and so the uh, usually I don't know what the end of the film is going to be until we get to shooting the end and then we go oh that's I guess that's the end. <laughs> and so it's a I guess a very different approach than you know most filmmaking is and uh, and Rembrandt laughing is one of my personal favorites. So it's also one of the most painful for me to watch because John English, who played the lead guy, is dead. Uh, Roger Ruffin is dead. <laughs> it's just you know I go over the you know the three or four people in the film are dead. So that's a little. And John not only played the lead role, but he did music for four or five of my films. And uh, you know, so it's a little hard to look at. But I, I like the film. It's it's one of my few warm films, right? The central tone of it is quite warm and and nice about nice people. Not that long. I mean, I'm I'm never based in anywhere very long. <laughs> uh, I think I, I I don't. That was eighty nine. Uh, I'd been in and out of San Francisco. I think since. 85 maybe, 86, something like that. But, you know, a period and then gone away for a year and then whatever. So I've been familiar with San Francisco since 68 when I moved from the Midwest to the West Coast. Any other questions? I got one there. This is the first film of yours that I've seen and they are simply gorgeous. Um, had you intended from the beginning that the end be as violent? No, I didn't. I didn't really know what the end would be until we were a fair bit of the way through shooting, and then I thought, oh well, you fly an airplane, you're depressed, so maybe crash the airplane, kill yourself. <laughs> kind of a trivial ending in my uh, uh, this film. I like it as an experiment uh, to see how diffuse I could make a narrative and other things, that, but I, I don't really it doesn't quite work for me. Right? But I think it's, it, I don't think it's bad. It's just it's, there's something about it that I just, you know, I, and I don't, I, and I haven't been able to figure out what it is. Right? I don't really understand what it is that I find a little problematic. But uh, you know, I, I I I like so much of it. I like the 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 setting an ambient in which the story becomes not secondary, but even lower than that on the totem pole of import and just sort of just sort of feel this stuff. And maybe that's what I, maybe that's my problem is because this, the story with the guys is such a clash with the rest of the movie. I mean, the rest of it's beautiful and whatever, but that sort of makes it more interesting to have the friction between here you are in this beautiful place and everything is so wonderful. <laughs> You guys are acting like cats and dogs. <laughs> and uh, maybe I, I didn't, I don't think when I make movies, you know, I don't have ideas and think about them and say, well, I'm trying to express this. I, I just get, get together enough pieces to make a movie and make a movie and find out whatever that was in it. And that's, I guess, what I found out in this one. John, I think if you'd cut from the guy angrily flying his plane to the phone call and left out the discovery of the body, a la Rembrandt laughing, it would have fixed it up. But that's just my yeah, advice. I, 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 you, I'm sure you thought of it. Yeah, I sort of agree that the, the body on the beach should go. But I'm not interested in going back to it. <laughs> Questions? Oh, okay. there you go.
difference. Um, I don't know much about you, John. Um, uh, I just want to tell you that I was really enjoyed the movie. Um, kind of like an experience. I've, I haven't seen uh, movies like this so much, and it was exquisite as far as I'm concerned. Um, probably I would agree the 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 I would have been perfectly happy without the ending that that part of it. it mm -hmm. um, I just love the gaps, the stillness within um, somehow everything worked uh, the 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 nature and these two human beings somehow merged. Um, I, I was reminded of, of like a kind of a holo holographic image that each part of it represents the whole. It was like um, every five minutes of it could have been satisfying in and of itself. Uh, and then the whole thing put together was, uh, it was just lovely. Thank you. Um, and I think you're an amazing man. Um, you're in a minority. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah, I'm trying to think of how to ask this question. It has to do with the what you. I would like to hear you think about what you brought to this in terms of having it be a relationship between two men instead of. Uh, heterosexual, heterosexual relationship because I think about in many of your films and I think about um, Surefire and I think of Bed You Sleep in, and I think to Coming to Terms and I think of other films that are about um, uh, males, males and male heads of households and patriarchs and uh, failed patriarchs and there seems to be something that you say in those films that has to do with um, patriarchal family structures and capitalism and American ideology that you wind very, you do very, you in, implicate the, the landscape and the atmosphere in those films. And uh, I, I saw you doing that with the landscape and I, I felt it in the depressed um, environs of the, of the place you were at. And I don't have any problems with seeing a male male relationship fall apart or anything but it it's definitely stood out as a, a sort of a, a change of tone and i'm wondering what you think about that and i don't know if i have a clear question about um that. well the thing is the things you say about the other films but once again i don't think about these things right I don't think oh, I'm going to make a film about an asshole male patriarch in Utah. I don't think that. I just go to the place, soak up the vibes, get whatever's necessary to do it, and then it happens. There wasn't a script for Surefire. I didn't know the Surefire would end the way it ended until we got to the end. Then I was like, oh, this, this is the right ending for it. And uh, ditto the rest of the films. You know. But it is, you know, I am kind of, con it's true that I'm very consistent and usually at the end of my film some characters are dead. <laughs> but that's, that long ago I intellectualized that for myself. I said, you can't tell stories about life if you don't have death in it. Because implicit in any deep sense of life has got to be, it comes to an end, people die. Often not nice ways, but but I and so long ago intellectually I thought probably now I just feel that I just feel well it isn't really full if you're going to do a film about human beings it's got to be death has to be snuck in it somewhere whether it's benign like in uh, in Rembrandt laughing somebody dies but it's so discreet some people don't even know somebody died when they look at Rembrandt laughing. <laughs> You know, because it's it's done so delicately that you you know some people don't know that's his ashes in a, in a jar at the end, and uh, but it's just for for ages I you know it's just like to me making uh, you know I play stupid country western right I write my stupid country western songs I play them and get much better than I used to be. <laughs> I practiced a year in Ragusa, Italy, with my new electric guitar, <laughs> and. Uh, 
the thing is, if I'm playing music, and I'm certain it's true for any musician, if you think, you fuck up. Right? And long ago I, th I ex began to address, okay, I'm making a film, and to me it's like, like I'm playing music. And so I think basically at the point where I felt uh, that I knew my instruments well enough, I knew a camera, I knew editing, I knew sound, I knew all that well enough to say that now I can just play, right? I don't, need a, I don't need a crutch of a script. I don't need a storyboard. I can just walk in the room and I'm so cinematic, I go ch -ch -ch. Most of them, you know, uh, 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 like uh, probably most people saw, say, All the Fair Mirrors is the one maybe most people here might have seen. Uh, you know, like there are scenes in there that, that are 15 minutes of screen time that were shot in an afternoon because I can go in a room and go, I want this, that, and I, you know, and just patch it together cinematically, just very quickly. And so when I'm making a movie, it's just, I'm just, you know, I picked up my horn and I'm playing. And I'm, if I start thinking about what I'm playing, then I start having problems. And so, at least that for me, that's the approach I take. So, you know, I, I did not write what those guys said. So I had no, and I didn't tell them that's what I wanted to say. I said, okay, you're, you're a couple splitting up, right? And Steve grabbed out of his life, and John grabbed out of his, and then and they just basically squabbled about things that were very real to them. And I had no say about, you know, I want you to say this to reflect something. No, I just wanted them to do it, do whatever they did. So I didn't think about, you know, what's... But I didn't on the other ones either. I, I didn't do it on the bed you sleep in. I didn't think, oh, I'm doing this thing about... It just happened because that's how I see the world, right? Or how I see America. And it's not intellectualized, it's, it's... Well, you're saying, though, that it just, it just comes out. It just comes out again and again because of that's the... Because that's the way I see that's the... that's the song that you have in you. Well, that's, that's how I see the world. Sure. I mean, in general, yeah. In general, males left to their own devices are pretty much assholes. <laughs> How can we know about it? And other films that have been really it must have been like what's the is is plain plain talk is that it was more of a documentary about four corners in this mm -hmm. and and this one is much more scripted than uh, than these these narratives. Uh, four corners. Uh, yeah, plain talk was scripted after the fact. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I shot and then I wrote what I felt would, uh, you know, articulate something. But it wasn't scripted before. It was, you know, it was scripted as I edited and thought, well, I got to say something here and whatever. You have a question? Yes. You're uh, in in light of that comment. You're you're assured of with uh, Mitch Hampton takes on a whole new meaning for me. Uh, excuse me. The, your your short film with Mitch Hampton playing the piano takes on a whole new meaning for oh, me. Oh, okay, okay. He improvises that whole thing. I know, right? Right. But um, this actually um, blue star. Uh, Blue straight kind of uh, uh, reminded me of a of a uh, slow moves in a way without the without as much of the humor, perhaps. <laughs> um, but uh, um, I was wondering, uh, uh, kind of a more utilitarian question: How did you how did you arrive at the title of the film? Uh, how did I? Well, it's shot on the Strait of San Juan de Fuca. Mm -hmm. uh, You're talking about this film? Yes. Yeah. So it was shot in Port Angeles, which is on the Strait of San Juan de Fuca, which separates Canada from the U.S. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was a straight, and then because the general tonality was kind of down, blue, sad, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so I, I, I had played around with it. You know, I, I, I had other things, but they all had blue in it. Plus, ages ago, like 40 years ago, I wanted to make a film on in the Southern California coast, Del Mar, Encinitas area. And uh, I, I, that one was going to be, and I never got around to making it. And I wanted to call it Coastal Blues. Mm -hmm. So I sort of resurrected part of my title. And uh, I did not meet... I don't think I consciously meant that the the straight part of this would have other connotations. It would be spelled differently anyway. Right, right. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, there you go. 
Do you ever watch mainline movies, and what do you look for if you do? Um, basically, no, I do not. Um, I I do workshops and have taught at the university for four years in Korea. And I basically tell my students, they'll I say, well, did you see this? Did you see that? And they say, I, if a film has an over-the-shoulder, you know, back and forth, two people talking, if it has that, I, I'll just leave. Right? Because, which means I leave 99% of films, because that's, that's, that's how most films are, you know, grammatically structured, is that kind of, not, and it's not just that, it's other things that, that irritate me and, and, you know, Basically, I'm not really interested in films that are just about people. If there isn't something visually, cinematically going on that's that I have never seen before, like this afternoon, I spent two hours with Nathaniel Dorsky looking at his films in his basement, his newer films, and I kept seeing things I'd never seen before. But I know he can do that, so I have no problem sitting down to watch Nathaniel's films. And um, I just... I'm not, I don't want to see an ordinary film. I don't want to see a narrative film that's more or less conventional. And uh, because it, I, at this point, you know, I don't have that much time yet to live, and I certainly want to live it a different way than looking at boring movies that I already saw 3,000 times, right? In, in form and, con, you know, in form and content, they're all, they're all more or less the same, right? And once in a while, you get a kick in the butt, and you'll see something where they actually did something uh, uh, what was three or four years ago? There was an Oscar winner. The first time I ever liked an Oscar winner, and it was a Birdman, because I saw something I'd never seen before. Because the, I saw a well-executed single-take movie. You know, visually, it was a single continuous take without a cut, a cut in it, and it was excellently I, the story. I didn't care about him. I didn't give him a fuck about some some guy like that. But the the execution of making this seamless continuous thing that, that put you over time, space, everything, and, and did it so well. You know, as a, as a person who makes films, I know how difficult it is like, to have all that technical apparatus, and in that case, particularly, all the actors were trapped in a highly technical box, and they had to look like as natural as could be, and they did it. You, know, you didn't see any actors waiting for the camera to come to them. When the camera came, life was going on. And I thought he executed that fantastically, even if I didn't give a shit about the story. And I, I, and I did think he should have ended it at a different place. He, it should have ended when he, when he shoots himself on the stage. And the hospital and all well, that was silly, stupid. Um, anyway, that's... So once in a while I'll go... I, the only reason I... I'll tell, I just said that. The reason I went to see that film, which normally I would not have gone to see that film, is I was in Lincoln, Nebraska. A guy I know who runs this uh, Ross Cinema uh, had been sitting with, in, in the thing with me uh, giving a, la, uh, a workshop to some students where I had said, if there's, a, you know, if there's an over-the-shoulder shot, I leave. Right? And he came up to me and said, uh, John, you might want to see the movie going on on the other side because there isn't any over-the-shoulder shot. So I said, okay, I'll give it a try. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I really liked it, you know. Other film I saw recent, recently, for three years ago, I don't know, four years ago, uh, I liked uh, Leo Carax's uh, Holy Motors. I thought that was a wonderful movie, which I think where, you know, it, it played in big cities for a week and was gone. You know, I, I was in Portland when I saw it and it was there for one week. And when I went, there was like three people in the audience because it was, you know, a, a very well produced, wonderfully acted uh, experimental movie, basically. That's one way to look at it. Questions? Yeah, yeah, lots of time. Don't worry about it. One of the um, last interviews I read uh, in the popular press or weekly press that uh, published at the time, it's already been a few years now, but I remember you mentioning that you had to leave the country, that it was necessary to your filmmaking because of the environment here. And wonder if you'd care to say anything about how that has developed for you over the years and if everywhere else is catching up to us or if it's still 
Well, uh, I suspect this must have been at least 20 years ago. It could yes? have been about 15 at least. I'd okay. Um, well, I did go to Europe uh, for, for, and stayed in Europe with never coming back to the States for 10 years, um, mostly in Portugal and Italy. And um, uh, when I went, yes, it was true that the, the probability of being able to make movies on the scale of uh, Oliver Mears or films like that um, was much better prospects over there. Um, but more or less around the same time, just a little bit afterwards, it, it first digital video came along and uh, basically relieved one of the having to deal with uh, money people and thinking about money whatsoever. Not even, you don't have to think of a story that will recoup a little money because in digital, you're, you know, this film cost me $200. If it cost that, it probably didn't cost that. Plus, Steve's an excellent cook, and I was staying in his house, so I I got fed, you know. And he, I mean, he's really an excellent cook. So every time you sit down for a meal with him, you might as well be in a five star restaurant. <laughs> so you know, I was eating two hundred and two hundred dollar meals <laughs> every night you know, while while I was there, and uh, and uh, so I guess I. I I, I didn't spend two hundred dollars. I, I received two thousand dollars in food, um, and so yes, I went over there. But then digital video came along quickly. I did make a film over there in Italy. Uh, I had another that I was going to make in uh, Austria, and uh, was dealing with two asshole crooks. And I I left after it had begun because they just were just jerks. Um, and then I decided I don't want nothing to do with this anymore. I've had enough of this kind of bad experience with, with uh, uh, people who's interested in, in money or the glamour of films or whatever it is. And, uh, 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 and digital came along and then I've made, you know, and that's very interesting. I jumped into digital well before it became, you know, okay, I, I, I got into it in 1996. Uh, and you know, when when critics would write, oh, the, the gritty, you know, they, they said it looked ugly. Well, actually, digital, old digital video and can look quite extraordinarily beautiful. I know I have friends who Leighton Pierce makes extravagantly beautiful films in digital video. And, it, you know, if you try to make it look like 35, then you're a stupid asshole. You know, you shouldn't, you know, although when it came out, people were desperately trying, how do we make it get the film look so it looks like a, a 35 millimeter movie when it's instead this beautiful medium in and of itself that can look like nothing like a movie. It can look quite beautiful in, in a different way. And uh, so I started making digital films. I, for example, I had an argument with the, the Berlin Festival where I used to be a regular. And, and then I started working in digital. I said, well, yeah, we'll take your film. We'll put it in video sidebar. And I said, I don't want to go in a video sidebar. Just because it's made on video doesn't mean it's somehow not as good as film. And these people are friends of mine, the Gregors. And, uh, you know, actually, I just had a lunch with them last year. And they said, well, John, you were right. Because you know, I, I, I had a real run-in with them. Because for four years, I wouldn't accept my stuff. Because I said, if you're going to show it, you show it just like it's a film. And, and, and they didn't do it, and then over dinner he said, well, John, you were right, you know, the digital was, was the thing. And this is weird because of the festival that, that sort of specialized in avant-garde and blah, blah, blah. And you say, avant-garde, but we have to stay with celluloid no matter what. I mean, <laughs> along comes another medium that allows you to do other things, and we can't experiment and play with that. Um, so, so when I switched to, to DV, uh, you know, basically, uh, since then, I've had a, uh, basically festivals don't want to show my work, by and large. I have like four or five long films that have never been showed publicly because nobody wants to show the kind of films I'm doing. Because festivals, along with most other venues for, the, for filmmaking, have all, whether they're conscious of it or not, become highly commercialized. And they're concerned about getting butts in seats, and certain kinds of films are not going to get butts in seats. It's that simple. So, um, so I went to Europe to whatever and take my chances, and then I then I I decided to totally pull out of the film business as a business. And you know what I make, I make for myself, and 
you know, I have a cluster of uh, actor friends who are happy to fly across the country and work for me for free. You know, I give them a place to stay, and that's about all I can do for them. And I cook, and I feed them, and and and. Uh, but I have a cluster of people who you're making a film, John. Please make another film. <laughs> and uh, at this point, I I think I'm more or less ready to stop. You know, I have three long films, none 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 with actors, uh, that I should I, I I feel obliged to finish, and uh, and after that, I'm sort of. It's just not, doesn't make any sense anymore. I, I'm hoping that doesn't happen. But what are the hopes of, um, regardless of that, getting some sort of retrospective locally, PFA, something? Uh, these people all know me. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I don't think it will happen. Also, but do it, doing a real retrospective of me now would be a major league job for any archive because I have 40 long films and three more waiting in the wings. And uh, uh, that's a large bit of shit to do. Plus, I have, you know, six programs of short films at least, right? So, so I don't, you know, I, actually, I have thought over the last year that I sort of to is try to write a polite letter, which as people think I, you know, I have a reputation of not being polite, but that's stupid people's, you know, where people, where these, all this shit comes from. It's, you know, once you're in the public eye, you know, you people say what they want. Um, but I've been thinking that I should write all the archives of the world and, you know, and say, you know, I, well, one, of, one of you should maybe do this, you know, it's like, I think my work's pretty good, and a lot of other people do. So, uh, you know, but then I look at my career and I say, uh, you know, here I am, 74 years old, I've made 40 films, I was at one point modestly well known, so it's not like I'm hiding under a rock. And there's never been one book written about my films. Not even been a long, long magazine article. And I wonder, what is it about, about my work that doesn't attract the kind of people who no. There's a guy in London who's wrote some stuff, and maybe he'll end up doing a book. But it's I just I, it's clear that I, whatever I'm doing, academics are not attracted to this. Even though I would look at it and say, "Ooh, it seems like such juicy meat," <laughs> analyze and go blah blah blah. But it doesn't happen. So. Your themes and your style are so varied. That could be part of well, I think that's part of it. Is 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 that you know I I don't make the same film again and again. Like James Benning is a good friend of mine, and he's being very successful right now in the art world and installations and and all that, and uh, and he would be a case in 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 point of, you know, in the in the modern arts, if you make the same thing again and again and again, <laughs> then you will get rewarded, because people, in a, in a way, know what to know what they're gonna what to expect, and they get it. And uh, I, uh, I really like James, and I like a lot of his films, and some of his films I find uh, not interesting at all. You know, I don't want to watch 21 People Smoke Cigarette, uh, for example. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he's very, you know, he makes some really wonderful films, and he makes some that I just feel like he's cataloging. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so a number of things just came up there. One thing is, is that you keep, you've been threatening for a number of years, like, you're done. That's yeah. the end of it all. Um, well, you know, so, George Lucas threatens he's going to make an experimental movie, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, one question would be, if you're done, then what are you going to do instead? And then also, do you really think that? Do you think, and you're done because why? You've run out of ideas? Okay, so those are that's one set of questions. And the other one is, is uh, I was thinking about who's going to archive this stuff. So, yeah, I think you should at least try to get... Send out your polite letter. Well, it, uh, all my stuff is stored at the uh, at the uh, Netherlands Film Archive, you know, so I can be assured that it's all going to be underwater in fifty years. <laughs> 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 huh. That's really good about. <laughs> uh, so okay, so that that's. Oh yeah, yeah. You were talking about the varied 
Oh, varied styles. See, I would disagree. I think that there's a number of themes. Someone, I don't know that I would read a book about a film, films, but uh, there are a number of themes throughout your movies, your films, that are similar, and they aren't all in the same film, and they're not, there's, but there's a lot of similar stuff there if someone really wanted to sit down and write a book about it. Yeah, well, I, I agree. I mean, I, my view is I make thing, films that are very varied, but if you look at them, they all look like one of my films, even though they might be completely different from each other, but you, underneath it is my eye and my, maybe my sense of time and what I'm told is my bad capacity for telling stories, you know, that I don't know how to tell stories. And I say, well, I can tell a story. I, I know, how to, you know, a lot of my films will, will leave people in tears. Well, somehow something's working, <laughs> even if it, isn't told the same old way, right? Anyway, there was something. What will I do? Well, uh, uh, I have no idea when I'm going to keel over and die. It could be tomorrow, or it could be 10 years from now, or it could be 20 years from now. Um, I, I like to paint. Uh, I write a lot. Uh, I, I, if I put on, I've had people tell me I should organize some of my blogs as books because, because, and I look, I've looked at them and I agree that with some editing, I certainly have a few books that have already been printed on the, the net uh, in the form of blogs and and. Uh, and uh, and if I could, I'd like to learn how to do nothing, but so far I've failed in that endeavor because my brain just is like, you know, maybe not thinking, but something else. I have a hyperactive, overactive thing, and I you can't sit tight for 10 minutes and not do anything. So, so But there are other things to do aside from making films or videos. Although I do have a backlog, I have in some hard disks, I have at least... 50 hours of highly experimental looking stuff, which if I took my bother, I could organize and say, here's this experimental film, and here's that one, and here's this, and, here's, and it's all very beautiful stuff, but nobody's ever seen it. Not because I didn't try to show it, but because, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty much in film people's minds, I'm billed as some kind of new narrative, you know, a fiction new narrative filmmaker. And if I make something that's completely abstract, or uh, like I have an extremely beautiful film which uh, called Bowman Lake, where I went to Bowman Lake in Glacier National Park, and I sat there all day long from sunrise to sunset and shot shots, and it's like a two, two hour and 20 minute long film where you see a single shot of Bowman Lake, but it's not pixelated, I hate pixelating that way. And it just looks like real natural time, except the light comes and goes, and the, there's a little wind on the lake, and so it's choppy, and then it's glassy, and then the light does this, and the light does that, but all very slowly, because there's like two minutes. There, there's shots of five minutes, and there's a one and a half minute dissolve getting from one shot to the other, so you don't, you don't see a dissolve, you just see the, a slight compression of a whole day in a way that you would never sit there and look at a lake that way. In reality, you'd be too distracted by other things. But in a cinema for two two hours, you just look at this stunning, gorgeous play of light and water and the mountains and everything. Nobody's shown it. I, <laughs> what can I do? You know, and I, I, you know, I, I'm. It's way too late in the game for me to go groveling, right? It's like, okay. I think I can speak for the rest of the staff here. We would love to have you back and show, so some more of your films. <laughs>